right, that was awesome. That's great. So I know you have a whole bunch of gigs still left before coming up this week. It this week it's in CMU, the Diwali party, the undergrad Diwali party. Okay, that sounds great, and hopefully it's helping you put a little bit of a dent in the CMU tuition rate or insignificant. I don't think you've seen this. Okay, thing. okay, all right, all right. <laughs> but you're getting a great education in return, right? So it's all gonna be worth it. This week is insane. I love it. That's awesome. Great. I have an ID. If some, of, if one of you less, uh, then come in. It's still valid till 2024, so you have a year to go. All right. Okay, so let's get started. We have a ton of material to cover today. We are going to pick up where we left off in the last class. And if you remember, we had talked about two-phase locking, and then we had started to talk about hierarchical two-phase locking, which was a way to balance the number of locks you have to acquire. Uh, versus allowing parallelism in the system. And uh, the types of things that we would do with that, if you remember, there was this compatibility table. So life is no longer just a shared lock and an exclusive lock, but now we also have these other different lock modes, including these weird things called IS and IX, which are intention to do something as you traverse down the hierarchy. And there's a very interesting lock mode called six lock, which is, I have a shared lock on everything else below, but if I need to grab something in an exclusive lock mode, I will grab an X lock explicitly. But S locks the entire hierarchy at which that six lock is sent. So how do we use these? Let's go look at a couple examples. Imagine we have a very simple database, one table and a bunch of tuples uh, below it. So we have a bunch of transactions. And remember the thing that we are trying to do is to get as much parallelism in the system as possible without having to acquire a lot of locks because acquiring locks has overhead, right? So you have to put stuff in the lock table and you have to do deadlock management and all kinds of other stuff. So we were working with Andy and his bookies uh, example where uh, you want to read Andy's record from this table. So that's transaction T1. And so we'll start by accessing the record, you'll always access the record through the hierarchy, right? The hierarchy mirrors the storage hierarchy. So you'll open up the file and start a scan on that. And you start to read these records as you go through it. And the way you would go about doing this is you will set an intention to share lock in the table, right? You're not grabbing a S lock on the table because you don't want to block everyone. You'll just grab an IS lock in that table. So if you go back again to this lock hierarchy, as you can see in the lock hierarchy, the uh, lock modes that are really restrictive is like X, right? Nothing is compatible with it. You want lock modes with a lot more green in the rows corresponding to that, right? So you can see how IS lock has a lot more greens with that, right? A lot more things are compatible with it, but it's not an explicit shared lock mode. You have to grab that explicit lock mode as you go further down. So coming back over here to our example, we'll to read a record, you'll grab an IS lock on the table. The other lock modes are still permissible. So other transactions who need those compatible lock modes can still proceed. And then you start to go and grab the S lock on the record that you go need to read. Okay, for now, assume indices are not present. We'll talk about that briefly today, if not in the next lecture. But transaction T1 grabbed only two locks, an IS lock and an S lock. So far, that seems like if I only had S and X lock and I'm only reading one record, I grabbed one extra lock, right? I grabbed an IS lock plus an S lock. So did I do worse here? Maybe, but why do we have these lock modes? Let's go uh, 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 and imagine what happens in this case if you didn't know where Andy's record is. And so you might actually be going through and grabbing a whole bunch of uh, locks on these tables. So now let's go take a look at another mode so let me just back up from there. We are assuming no uh, indices. So if you know exactly whether, in this case, we still assume that we know kind of where Andy's record is, tuple one. So we just have these two lock modes, right? If you didn't know, you would go and grab S locks as you go further down. If you knew that you needed to grab all the read locks on the records below, what you would have done is on the table, you would have grabbed a S lock or a SIX lock. And more likely, just in this case, you would have just grabbed an S lock so that is permitted. If you knew that you're going to touch every record, there's nothing that stops you from grabbing an S lock on the table itself. So that's still permitted. But when you think you don't need that lock 
at a higher level and you can do with a weaker lock because you kind of know what your access path, path is going to be below, you can grab a weaker lock mode up above. Okay, so let's go into this with a little bit better example. Yep. So what, what really is like the purpose behind having something like an IX lock? Yeah, so the question is, what's the purpose of an IX lock? It's exactly what we are going to do right now. Imagine I had grabbed an S lock on the table, and that's all I had done before. I didn't have these different lock modes. A concurrent transaction that wanted to go and update the bookies record, and Andy and the bookies records are obviously different records, right? So what is permissible now, because you have different lock modes, is that second transaction can say, I'm going to access the table and some record below it, but the table I'm only going to lock in an IX mode. I intend to lock a record down below. And then on the record it wants to write, which is the bookies record, which is this last record in that case, it'll grab a write lock. So now we allowed a read to some portion of this table to happen while a write was happening to some other portion of the table. Okay, and we had these two different lock modes. So we are allowing more of these things to happen. And these different lock modes uh, also allow us to go, nothing stops us from grabbing an S lock on the table and switching over to a protocol like that. We just have more toys to play with now. Question? Yeah, so in this case, when we grab an IX and an IX block, uh, what if we're doing a sequential scan? So yeah. We decoupled and then. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I confused the situation a little bit. I said ignore the indices, but then in Andy's case, I basically just still only set one lock. So the natural question is, oh, how did you know that tuple one was Andy's lock? So uh, I'm assuming I know that. If I didn't know that, if I didn't know that, and if I had to grab an S lock on everything, then if I did an IS lock on the table for the first transaction, then as I go further down, I will have to grab S locks on everything. At that point, I could decide whether the S locks is on the page or the tuple, but I'm still grabbing way more locks. So as I said, if I know I'm a read-only transaction, I will not do the uh, IS lock on the table. I will just grab an S lock on the table. I'm still allowed to play all the games I was playing before. right? I just have more, more room now to play around with things. Now, if I knew there was an index and I knew record one is where it was, that's where this really shines. So I'm not showing an index as a separate access path, but the general theory works out where this resource hierarchy of where the data is organized is not necessarily a tree, like a database to tables to records, but a DAG. So it could be a database to table to indices to records, and you could have index and records go through that, and this whole theory still works. So I, uh, and again, plug for the advanced database class, we'll talk about DAG structures and stuff like that. But that's what was happening over here. I kind of knew tuple one is where it was, but I didn't show you the index, which seemed a little confusing. But the main point is I can still, if I wanted to grab an S lock, I could still do everything I could do with just two lock modes. I can do a lot more now. Okay. Release it. Yeah. So the a question is like, uh, can I grab an S lock and release it? and then go and grab the next lock, like the latch coupling we were doing in the B3 to keep it. Uh, the answer is, what will we violate? 2PL, you will violate 2PL. That means I no longer have a serializable schedule. So we shall not do that if you want 2PL semantics. Furthermore, to do a strong strict 2PL, we'll keep those locks till the very end, okay? But that's, you know, as we'll start to play around with the advanced concurrency control protocols that we are gonna start on today, you'll see we'll start to do that. We'll try to let go of stuff, or we'll do things with timestamps to try and guess what would happen the best way to do it and give us a little bit more room to rearrange stuff, right? This is, locks are a pessimistic form of transaction uh, of concurrency control, and they are basically doing it in the way, in the order in which things are happening. As we do timestamps and stuff, you'll see we can start to play around with other games. So I guess to confirm the practical difference between Having an IX on the table and not having an IX on the table. Like if we just had an X and an S down the yeah. table. The practical difference is that if we wanted to do an S lock on the whole table, then we have a conflict. Yeah, the IX lock would not have been allowed. T2 would not have it. So the exactly, that's right. So the question was, what what's the role of the IX in this situation? Imagine I knew I needed to read all the records. I would grab an S lock on the table and that would block everything. But imagine I also had this index and, and I said, you know, I really don't think I'm reading the whole table. I'm just reading a few records. I'll determine that by going through the index, which is not shown here, since you're trying to keep the material simple. Uh, but that index is going to tell me, go to tuple one. And on that, I will grab an S lock. That index is also telling go to tuple N for the bookies record. 
and that grab an S lock. And so I can go make all of this happen. As I said, you can still do the S and X lock stuff at any level as before. You just have more playroom now. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the question is, how does this all relate to the lock coupling stuff that we did in the B tree? Uh, I would say those are separate things. The intentional lock is to work with any arbitrary storage hierarchy in which you have this containment-like semantics that I've got some organizational structure like a table. Below that is another structure, pages, and then records. I didn't show pages over here. The lock coupling stuff that you used in the B tree stuff was very specifically in the B tree. And there you were at least, you were letting go of these latches that you were creating and then going forward. There semantically, what we are trying to do is that I'm going to treat the B tree as a logical structure and I'm going to allow maximum parallelism in that. All I need of the B tree is to retain its semantical structure so that I go looking for keys. I will find it if I have it. And if I don't have it, I don't. So we are playing around with tricks over there by releasing stuff. It's You'll start to violate strict 2PL stuff, but the tree as a whole will look like it is still behaving in the broader scheme as a semantical structure. So it's kind of like the nuance over here it needs a full lecture, but think about it this way. When we talked about conflict serializable and view serializable, Remember we said view serializable, if I know the application semantics, then I can play games that seem wrong, but the application semantics is all I care about and I could get more admissible schedules. Kind of what we are doing inside the B tree is keeping its structure intact. We are playing all these games because we know what a B tree semantics is. We're playing with the semantics to get more parallelism in there. Okay, this is a completely general scheme that works without, I don't know, you know, if I have a page and a record, all I'm saying is the page is a collection of records. It's a slotted page, whatever, doesn't matter, right? If it's, you know, you could apply this to LSMs, this will still work. Any hierarchical structure, this will work, okay? And again, this is a plug for the advanced database class where we spend a whole semester or half a semester talking about these types of things. Uh, more illustrate the question. I this illustrates, so the question is, does this illustrate the difference between latches and locks? Yes, definitely. What we were doing in the B tree was latches, but remember latches and locks are trying at some level to say, I want to make some form of parallelism safe. So that's kind of the interesting thing is like, there are ideas that can be crossed over from here to the other side. Should there be hierarchical latches? Nothing in the theory here says you can't play around with games like that. Now, would that be an overkill for the types of things you, are, you need to do? Maybe, maybe not, but these are open questions. They're trying to go after the same types of questions. They've come from different places, but the concepts, uh, uh, the concepts we're talking about over here with two-phase locking and, and uh, intentional locks are very general. And there are more than two types of latches now, right? In many advanced programming languages, there are more latch modes. And they'll start to play games that look like that. Okay, great question. Both of them are trying to make parallel, uh, have higher parallelism while making some notion of safety hold in the application, right? They stare that same philosophy. And then, you know, if you've taken an operating systems class, you think, you know, you're always encouraged to deal, think about mechanisms, right? Mechanisms are general. They're tool sets that you can use for doing things. This is a general mechanism that works with any hierarchical structure to make it safe. Okay, you might apply this in all kinds of places, even outside databases, once you understand the concept. Okay, great questions. All right, so now you can see what we are doing over here with these intentional locks. Uh, let's keep going and uh, take a look at how we might play around with three transactions. So here's a transaction that's going to scan all the records. Okay, it needs to scan all the records in this transaction. And what it can do is can grab a SIX lock, a six lock, six lock says, I have a shared lock on this, and by that it means everything below. Notice in all the hierarchical structure, we require that all access to records at the bottom of the tree, in this case records, have to go from top to bottom. So you have to follow that protocol, top down. If you read, again, in the advanced database class, it talks about it more formally. You always have to go top down and release stuff bottom up. Ignore all of that if you don't, because it'll be like an hour conversation, but there's a protocol you have to follow to do this. Just top down is what we need for now. So you'll follow top down. This means no one can go grab an S lock on a record because they have to come through me. They have to come through the hierarchy. So I'm putting a lock there saying, I have a shared lock plus something else. I may grow actually get an X lock 
on some records below. So this is a transaction that may want to read all the bank accounts, for example, and give $50 more to the highest bank account. First, it needs to determine which the highest bank account is or accounts are if they are the same value and then do some updates to that, right? Read everything and update a few things, okay? So we'll stop and it is allowed with the protocol and the hierarchy. I'll let you work that out. But after a six lock, I can allow, take an uh, X lock on the record below in the same transaction. That is allowed by the protocol. Okay, and that's what the six lock allowed us to do as we were further going down. Now, a second transaction that just wants to read a single record comes in. That's the only record it wants to read. As you can see, there's no conflict between these two transactions because they are doing different things, right? They're not conflicting on that record. But if I didn't have a six lock, I would have to grab an X lock on the table if that's the only level of hierarchy I had. If I only allowed table level locks, then that's what I would do and I wouldn't get parallelism. Remember we talked about how MongoDB had a global database lock, right? So there are the, of course they don't do that now, but in this case, what I can do is I can go and grab an IS lock intention to share, which is compatible with the six lock in the, in the matrix and I'm allowed to proceed. Now notice what happened, transaction T1 only grabbed two locks. So it's efficient, two locks, and only lock exactly what it needed to do. And transaction uh, uh, T1 grabbed two locks, and you know, yeah, you might say it grabbed the IS lock, but it wouldn't have if it was operating under a simpler scheme, but that's gonna be a little bit of trade-off. Some transactions are gonna have to take a little bit more locks, but the bigger ones are gonna get a lot less locking, locks that they have to do, right? It's a trade-off. Right? And again, as I said, nothing tells you you have to use all the locks. It's just saying, if you want to play these games, you now have the way to do it. This other transaction that wants to read all the records, it can go in, but obviously it has, <coughs> uh, it'll, it can try to grab an S lock, for example, on the table, and that won't be compatible with this lock, so it's gonna have to wait, right? In the compatibility matrix, that's not allowed, okay? So it doesn't mean transactions never have to wait, some of them will have to wait, but you're gonna get more parallelism and you're trying to do this balance between how many locks do transactions have to acquire and how much parallelism you go allow in the system. Okay, questions? Yep. Is there a way to upgrade locks? Is there a way to upgrade locks? Yes, and we will defer that to the advanced database class because it could be that you might say, you know what, I'm doing a lot of X locks on the tuple transaction T1. Can I go and update my six lock on the table to an X lock? That's allowed. You go through an uh, upgrade uh, protocol. The lock table, which I told you, has a hash table, has things that are waiting for it. In that are upgrade requests too. And upgrade requests are treated differently than people just waiting for it because uh, you might want to give them higher priority to get ahead of the queue and get the work done if it doesn't conflict. Okay, other questions? Yeah, yes. So, and uh, SIX lock versus S lock. So let's just go back here. Yeah, so you would do a shared lock. Uh, and again, it will depend upon how you are implementing it. So if you say, I know in this transaction that I'm gonna read everything, then I will grab an S lock on the table. I'm gonna read every record. But the other transaction took a six lock because it said, I want to also update some. So it will depend upon the operation that the transaction wants to do. And you'll try to grab the weakest lock mode at the highest level. What if you want to do like a subset of the records? In the yeah. Don't yeah. You don't know whether it will clash with another transaction. Yeah. So, yeah, the question is what if I have to uh, lock a subset of the object? So let's take the transaction T1. And after this, I'm going to stop because we are now like, we need three lectures in. I love it, but I need to get through some of the material. But this, these are great questions. So uh, you're, uh, you're asking a very interesting and important question. I am transaction T1. Okay, so just let's focus on that. It, let's say when it started, it was a, a transaction that the code was written as begin transaction, scan all the records to find the interesting bank accounts. And then for those interesting bank accounts, second SQL statement, go and update them, end transaction. So transaction is kind of two pieces of work. 
does it know how many records are going to be updated in that second phase for which it needs an X lock? What if it is all the bank account numbers are exactly the same? They're all the highest and everyone needs to be given 50 bucks. Or what if the number of things that I need to update is more than, you know, more than one? Maybe it is all, half of the records. Should I have, imagine I was reading everything and then when I start to update, I find I'm updating everything. Wouldn't I have been better by just grabbing an X lock on the table up front? The answer is yes. But uh, that would go through the lock upgrade request, for example. And so these protocols are then defined in more detail as to what you do, what's the way in which you follow. The general rule is try to grab the slowest lock at each level of the hierarchy as you go down. And that way you are allowing as many others to go through. And then if you start to find, whoops, I'm grabbing a lot of X lock, I should upgrade my table level lock to an X lock, you'll go through an upgrade path. So don't make static decisions. You'll try to make more dynamic decisions because you don't know till you actually start to look at the values. Okay. So again, you know, this is a full lecture uh, uh, in the advanced database class, but you guys are thinking of the right things. It's like, what am I winning and how do I win? And it's a complicated answer. Okay. The only thing you need to know is now you have more toys to play with and you can follow the protocol and everything is safe. All of 2PL holds. We'll grab these locks, whether they're intentional or real locks, hold them till the end of transaction, and strong sig 2PL, you'll hold them till the very end, won't go through that uh, monotonically decreasing phase. Okay? So all the things we talked about 2PL work with hierarchical locks, and that's beautiful. All right? And you can prove that, and there's a paper that proves that formally and says, don't have to take my word for it, but here's the proof. All right, lock escalation, we just talked about that. If I have to switch over and upgrade a lock to something else, then you that's called lock escalation. And, and there are protocols that you go follow through that too. All right. Uh, notice with all of these things, just reiterating from the last class, you're not acquiring these locks manually. Like you as a SQL application programmer is not acquiring the locks manually, typically. Uh, those SQL statements do have options to allow you to lock entire tables, not recommended. You'd only do that if you're a power user that really knows what, uh, what you are doing. But in general, these will get acquired at the right point in the system. You as a database system programmer, if you're the person developing the database system, you will have to worry about that and find the right abstraction, whether it's on the call to the buffer pool or the call to the open of the page, uh, open of the file or open of the page or open of the index. You'll have to go start making these lock calls in there. But the application programmer generally doesn't. However, SQL has, many database systems have options to allow uh, this explicit locking of tables. Uh, it's not part of standard SQL. And for example, in Oracle, Postgres, and DB2, they sort of have a diff similar syntax or the same syntax. They can say lock table, name of the table in, and give an ex explicit mode. They'll only allow you to give you shared and exclusive locks as request. And you're saying, look, I know you're going to do all this hierarchical locking and stuff like that, but I know what I'm doing. I want a shared lock. Don't try to do this other stuff. And they may not be doing hierarchical locking. They may be doing some other locking protocol or uh, timestamp-based protocol, like we, we'll see MVCC, which is uh, uh, what Postgres does. But this allows you to say, I know what I'm doing. Go ahead and grab that. But now, along with great power, comes great responsibility that the application code better know what they're doing. And so generally not recommended. You start splintering your SQL code with all of that stuff. We'll talk about isolation levels, which you can set at the database level to say, I want read committed or read uncommitted, but that's the lecture that we're going to start on next. Okay, so you can also, uh, SQL also has modes for when you're doing, uh, when you're doing a select query, and then you want to set an exclusive lock on the matching records. You can do that kind of like the transactions that I was saying. I'm going to read all of this stuff and then some part of it I'm going to do updates. So there are all kinds of ways in which you can start to give SQL hints in terms of what to do so that you get uh, locks at the appropriate time. You don't have to. The system will do the right thing. But if you want to, it's kind of like query optimization. The system does uh, things by itself, but every database system also has hints but you can say, oh, R is joined with S, do join that first and then use a hash join for it. Don't try something else for it. So SQL also has optional hints. They again, not, those hints are not part of SQL, but you can give hints to tell, I'm gonna tell the optimizer what to do or at least tell you where to look. 
Similarly, there are things where you can explicitly start taking over some of these transaction mechanisms. So wrapping up the 2PL part is this two-phase locking is used in almost every database system because you this whole idea of how to get uh, this concurrency control is super important, and that theory is what uh, all the products are built off. Uh, we talked about locks and the protocols, 2PL and strong sig 2PL. When you do locking, that doesn't mean you're completely out of trouble. You can still get into deadlock, so you need deadlock prevention mechanisms, and you can detect the deadlock and handle it, or you can do deadlock prevention. And of course, we talked about hierarchical locking and all the other fun stuff that comes with it. All right. Let's wrap this part up and now go, we are, we are running behind in the semester and uh, as you have probably guessed. The good thing is if you keep asking questions and make us run behind, then there's less stuff we can ask you questions in the, in the final exam. But that also means the last chapters we hope to get through, we won't get through, so it's like a trade-off. But uh, you know, keep asking questions, it's good. All right, so, so now we are going to talk about a different way to do concurrency control, right? We said locking and we looked at all the protocols. And effectively the main theory we got from everything we've discussed before is we want this notion of serializable schedules so that we can allow arbitrary interleaving of actions from concurrent transactions, maximize the parallelism, but at the end of the day guarantee that the database is in uh, some consistent state as set up by the theory of the serializable schedule, okay? And we largely focused on this conflict serializable stuff, and we said there's this notion of view serializable that allows a little bit more, and we'll touch a little bit on that view serialization uh, uh, today with a different protocol. So two-phase locking, what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to do this concurrency control, the isolation part uh, of acid, right? It is the I in the acid, right? We're still on that topic, and when we introduced that topic, we had noted that there are pessimistic protocol. Locks are a pessimistic protocol, right? If you and I are going to have a read-write conflict or a write-write conflict or a write-read conflict, the lock is basically a way of saying, I'm noting that down and I will stop it at the first arc and I'm not gonna let the arc close, right? I'm just gonna, as soon as the arc forms, I'm gonna suspend one of the transactions, right? So I'm not gonna let the loop close, right? And hopefully you got that as we discussed this uh, uh, over the last two lectures. There's a, something that we're gonna start talking about today called timestamp ordering. That's not gonna need locks, right? All this discussion we had today is like, locks are expensive, you have to grab these many locks, you have to figure this out. With hierarchical locking, yes, we made life a lot better, uh, but is there a different way? And that's what we are going to look at with these types of protocols that are timestamp-based protocols. And we'll start with a very simple textbook example of timestamp uh, protocol called timestamp ordering. That's the name uh, of the protocol. and no one uses that, but it introduces the concepts on which we build the rest of it for the optimistic conferencing control and MVCC, which a lot of systems use, which is the topic for the next lecture, okay? So it's the foundation stuff we are going to talk about. Now, as we start talking about these protocols, a quick note, they will have names like timestamp ordering. Those were the names that were given when those protocols were invented in the 70s and 80s, or optimistic conferency control, right? But as you'll see, the terms that get used over there will feel a little confusing with everything that we talk about now because the terms were just getting evolved at that time. So bear with us, we want to keep that historical name for what the protocol is, and I'll try and point out where the name doesn't mean what it seems like it means, but we'll still keep that name around, okay? All right, so if we can, we're gonna try and get through both the timestamp ordering and the optimistic concurrency control protocol today. I don't expect we'll get through that, so we'll, we'll try. All right, so the timestamp ordering protocol has philosophically a different way. We're going to use timestamps, and the way we'll use timestamps is we'll have associated with records. Let's assume we are doing everything at a record level, right? So keep life simple. We'll mark when it was read, mark when it was written. So we'll keep timestamps like that around. And it's not always two timestamps, as you'll see with the optimistic concurrency control, it'll be just one timestamp. But the general idea is we're going to use the timestamps and if I can mark every time I read or write an object, then I can use those timestamps and say, hey, these two records, two transactions wrote or read to it, are they conflicting? If they're read in very different times, then I'm okay going forward with that. If they're conflicting, then can I resolve the conflict by finding a serial order in which it all works out? 
and have to do this across all the records that transactions touch. OK, so we'll also give transactions numbers. And those numbers now are not just going to be just random numbers, but they're going to mean something. So if I'm transaction 10 and you are transaction 20, then all my work should be done before your work. Our numbers correspond to the serial execution schedules order. So lower transaction stuff must be done first in that equivalent serial schedule than the other transactions. Of course, the work is happening all in parallel, but eventually we have to support a serial schedule, right? And the serial schedule, remember when we had two transactions, we said is T1 followed by T2 or T2 followed by T1. Now these T1s and T2s, the numbers are going to mean numbers. And we're going to need to ensure one happens before two if those are transaction numbers. Okay, and then we'll use the timestamps and we'll play around with tricks to say, let's assign the numbers carefully to get more parallelism. So we'll see how we do that. So everyone okay with the basic material that we now need? Timestamps and transaction numbers now matter. They're not random numbers. They determine the order of the serial schedule, serializable schedule, conflict serializable schedule that we are trying to achieve. All right, now where do these timestamps come from? What do they look like? Uh, some systems will use a timestamp that's a wall clock type. Just grab the wall clock and that's my timestamp. But obviously, if you're a distributed system, the clocks may be out. You can't quite do that. Sometimes what people will say is there's a global counter and I can uh, read it and then get my number. But of course, two people may try to read that number and increment it at the same time. Luckily, in hardware, you've got instructions that an atomic one cycle will allow you to read and update a number. So if I had a global counter, I protect it with one of those uh, instructions that the hardware says I can do atomically, then I can build a counter that I can count on. But again, that works if I have a single machine. If I have distributed machines, I have to do something else, which is kind of what Spanner has to do and all these distributed systems have to do. So that's like a logical counter or some combination of that. It's not as important where these numbers come from. It is, of course, important if you have to implement it. But the material today will just assume there's some way that we are getting these numbers from, because even that counter stuff has to be protected because multiple people may be trying to write to that counter at the same time, right? So it's a non-trivial thing. You can't ignore that if you're trying to implement something. Okay, so we have a number, we have these timestamps. Let's start with the basic time order protocol, which has the uh, following components. Transactions are going to read and write objects, but there's no locks now, right? This is a competing scheme. No locks are needed. Right uh, now, but remember, strict two PL and two PL was all about getting a serial schedule, right? So we will still get a serializable schedule, but without doing any of that stuff, right? So completely different way of thinking about it. Okay, every object will be grabbed, will be tagged with the timestamp of the last transaction that read and wrote it, right? So again, every object has these two timestamps. And when I say object, just refer to it as a record, but it's generalizable to other things. If I'm doing page level locking, the object is a page. If I'm doing file level locking, it's a file. And uh, 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 depends on what that notion is. Now, if a transaction tries to, so the main principle we'll do is the one that's written up over here at the bottom is, we'll use these timestamps philosophically in the following way. If, a, if I'm trying to do something to an object, read or write, I'll look at the timestamps there and say, whoops, what do these timestamps tell me? Did someone do something to this object, read or write? And they're ahead of me in that transaction number order or that logical order. If so, I need to back out of it because if I insert my operation now, I will end up, I'm guaranteed to end up with a non-serializable schedule. Okay, so now our problem just becomes how we develop these conditions, these simple equations that tell us when I shouldn't do bad stuff. And of course, every time I do some operation on an object, I better go update the timestamps, right? So that I can leave that marker behind saying I was here and this is what I did to it. Okay? Well, so let's get going. So the basic uh, 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 TO protocol, again, as I said, it's not practical, but it just provides us a foundation, is every time a transaction wants to read an object, it does the following, right? Uh, it is going to look at the, you're going to start to get a little bit more familiar with these equations. So let's just slow down on these slides. We'll say TS of TI, that is the timestamp of that transaction TI. Think of it as transaction number if that's all we have, right? And then the write that is happening 
to that object X. So I'm trying to do something to object X. In this case, transaction TI wants to read object X, right? That's the action noted at the top. And if I see that the timestamp, the right timestamp of that object is bigger than my timestamp, then something happened to the object that's a future value that I should not be seeing, right? Because these timestamps, these numbers now mean something. These timestamps mean something, right? So uh, I cannot basically, the most intuitive way to think about it is to say, I cannot read stuff from the future. Okay, I cannot see stuff in the future because otherwise if I start doing that, then I'm gonna get some sort of an anomaly, like I'll get a WR anomaly very easily if I start doing that or an RW anomaly, I start, in this case it would be RW. So, okay. So if I hit that condition where I'm seeing something in the future, I'll abort. Otherwise I will read, but now I need to let the world know that I read it. So I will update the read timestamp to be a little tricky here, to be the maximum of my timestamp and whatever was already there. Since reads are compatible with each other, and you'll see that in an example in a little bit, if reads are compatible with each other, this max is saying if another future reader got ahead of me, I don't care. I should simply not write, I should not have seen some future transactions write. Okay? So that max stuff you'll see in a second. And now one more thing that we will do here is we will go and say that we are going to also uh, going to make a local copy of that object that we just read so that we can start to uh, make sure that if I need to repeat that read, I'm okay with doing that. And you'll see that in a second, right? Because X's value will keep getting changed if I want to make sure repeatable reads, remember we had that repeatable read anomaly, right? If I want to prevent repeatable reads, then I need to make a copy for myself. Yep. Yes. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Yes, this can cause starvation, like deadlocks could call dead, uh, that locks could cause deadlocks. This will cause starvation. And there are ways of getting around that. Just hold on to that question for about five minutes. Good question. Yep, starvation will happen. And then we'll just make sure the timestamps uh, are assigned in a way that we don't infinitely starve someone. That's a quick answer. Okay, now we figured out what to do with reads. Now let's figure out what to do with writes. So for writes, the condition's a little complicated. TSTI is the transaction that's trying to write. Right? So that's the timestamp of the transaction. And then we check if the read or the write timestamp of the object we are trying to read is in the future. Okay, Again, similar to that, but for the writes, we have to check both the read and the write timestamp. For the reads, we just have to check the write timestamp. If you want to keep a mental model, the previous slide was about the RW anomaly. This is about the WR and WW. And if you understand dependency graph and cycles are bad, you can take any complicated protocol, put your head to it, and it'll start to look simpler. Okay? So now, this basically says I cannot write if a future transaction has read or written to an object, and I will abort if I detect that condition. Otherwise, I will write, and oh, I better tell the world about that, so I need to go and update the right timestamp. Okay? All right, let's take a, yep. When do you assign those RTS and WTS to yeah, when do we assign the RTS and the WTS? So let's actually go uh, into that right now with this example, and that will make it clear, okay? So here's an example. I've got a schedule in which transactions are happening. I've got begins and reads and writes. I've got a database. And now associated with each object, I'm going to have a read and a write timestamp. So every object is gonna need those two values that are associated with it. And let's start with the begin transaction. And let's assume right now that that's when we assign the timestamp. So transaction T1 actually is one. That's its number. Now this number has a meaning, which means all of T1 must happen before T2 in the schedule we are trying to, we are going to allow. Okay, now read happens. So now this is the first part. Remember two slides ago, we'll read and say, hey, what's the right timestamp of this object B? Oh, zero, fine, it's in the past. I can go read that and that's totally fine. And oh, I need to record that I read it. So I'll take the max of zero and one, which is one, and I put one there. Okay, there was that max call, if you remember, in the read, pro read portion of this protocol. All right, now I go to the second transaction, context switches over. Let's say the second transaction gets to run. 
it assigns its get transaction ID too. So now all of its action must happen in the final state of the database after transaction one. And then read it, reads B, and says, oh, I'm two. Write timestamp is zero. That's fine. I'll just make sure that everyone knows that I've read it. So I update the read timestamp to two, and I move on. Now I get to write. I have to write to this object B. And the write timestamp just before that happens, if I go back, was zero. I'm fine. The read timestamp is two, not in the future. right? So I look both at the read and write timestamp. They're not in the future. I can do that right and make sure the right timestamp is now my timestamp, right? So that answers your question, okay? Then context switches over to T1. It says I have to read of A, uh, and uh, that's okay because A was not read, so I'll just let everyone know that A is read. So I made the A, which is an object we hadn't touched so far, set it to be one. Same thing happens there, very similar to what happened to B. And then I go back to read this value A, and that's okay, because the right timestamp is still zero. T2 has interfered with me, but only on reads, so it doesn't matter. Reads don't interfere with reads. So notice how on the read side, I checked the write timestamp, and you now you can see why I didn't need to worry about the read timestamp on the read side. There's no RR anomaly, okay? Now, uh, this is okay. T1 is less than T2, but we don't. that's fine. That's allowed. Write happens, then we go update the write timestamp. That's also allowed. And this transaction commits, and it's as if, even though we had this interleaving, the final state of the database is T1 followed by T2. Okay? So a totally different mechanism that doesn't use locks, can use timestamps, but we have to use it properly. All right? So let's keep going. Second example. Uh, read A. Now you guys know how that works. You're going to go update that. Write of A happens. We go do that. So after the read write, the transaction has A values, read timestamp one, write timestamp or two. Right? Pretty similar to what we did so far. Now T2 commits. All right? Uh, T1 has to go write to a value A. What should happen here? Can it write to the value A? Because the write timestamp is two, right? So following that protocol that we just said, it cannot. So well, it violates that piece because it's an object in the future. I'm only one. Uh, my serial order in the config serializable is one followed by two. How can I see two stuff? That's wrong. So I cannot overwrite that. So transaction two has to go and basically uh, abort and uh, 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 then it's, and has to restart. At that point, it restarts. It will grab a new timestamp and go about doing its own business, okay? And when it gets a new timestamp, its timestamp will be more recent, but as we'll talk about, there are other ways of doing that. Yep, question. Yeah, question. Say that instead of reading, you are writing A, it says action one, and then you abort because... Yeah, so you're asking, oh, so the question is related to the cascading aborts kind of situation, right? What if T2, if there was some other interview between the write and the read, and there was a cascading abort situation? So can cascading aborts happen? Yes in the similar kind of way. This is doing the same type of stuff of uh, doing that. For, to avoid cascading aborts, you would basically say any aborting transaction. You'll do the same thing as we talked about. You'll have to do the, uh, you'll have to have the commit graph. It's called the commit graph saying who's committed, when can I commit, and then keep track of that to keep around. And again, it's like, I will defer that topic because we could go down a rabbit hole to go figure that part out. But this is very similar in philosophy to what happens with all the abort stuff. Go for it. Really bad, right? Yeah. Yes, correct. So this is a bad protocol from that perspective. Now a record, just even the reader, a pure reader is going to have to update timestamps. So it's making updates to some place in the database, and that is expensive. So no one implements this as you know. This is just a example to get us going. But we'll talk about more efficient ways to do this. Absolutely. Does this happen at runtime, or just like in the planning optimizing stage? Uh, but what part happens at runtime? Uh, can you be more specific? Yes. The timestamp stuff? Yes, yes, like checking what conflicts, checking when At runtime. So the question is, does a timestamp check happen at runtime or someplace else? Runtime. When I'm accessing the record, I'll check. Yeah. Well, the rationale behind it is that you execute, you don't know what's wrong. That's correct. 
interleaving order might be different for even for the same query but for different data. Yep, you you totally got that. So it all has to happen at runtime because otherwise the only thing you can do at static time is to grab an X lock on the database because you don't know what you're going to touch, right? And that as we talked about, you know, if you're building a database and are rushing for time, you want to get it correct. That's what you'll do, but it's it'll be a very slow database system. Questions? Can you analyze the transactions directly? So for that, I would need to know all the transactions that are gonna come while I'm running. I don't know how long I'm gonna run. I don't know what's gonna come while I'm running. So if I had a schedule of transactions, if I said, I have a database system that on Monday morning only does these two transactions and they touch only these two records and a perfect plan, then yes, but everything is, you know, you can't do that, right? The database is gonna get queries when it gets queries and you don't know how much stuff it's gonna take or touch. Uh, uh, in the data till it actually starts running. But it's good. You're thinking in the right ways. It's like, oh, can I get better at this if I knew something about the timing and if I knew something about the properties of, of these transactions? And what we want to do is to build something completely safe and general that no matter what happens, we are efficient and correct. Okay? Which is hard. Which is hard. All right. Other questions? Both of these are committed right now. Yeah. So the question is, do you abort T2? Uh, do you abort T2? Sorry, T2 has already committed, so it's fine. T1 is the one that we'll abort. Doesn't T1 come before? Like, our right for A? Is yeah. T2? Yeah, so the, you're asking a good question because I said T1 got transaction number one, so it's as if it is in the serial schedule ahead of T2. That is true. But right now, there's no dependency from T1 to T2, right? T2 is reading stuff that was already there before. So effectively, once we uh, abort T1, it's as if the world had started with only T2 in the picture. So wouldn't that like, mess up the rights? Then if we try to do T1 after that? Like... No, no. Which rights? So right now, we're on the right of A and T1. We'll abort it, so that right won't go through. Yeah. But wasn't that right supposed to happen before the T2, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know exactly what you're saying. So you're saying, I started by saying T1 and T2, if they're both in the system, I want the serial schedule of T1 followed by T2. I'm playing a little loose over here. We are aborting T1. So it's as if I'm saying, oh, you know what? I went and fixed it in a correct way so that T1 never existed. So when an abort happens in a serial schedule, it's all related to all this cascading abort and other stuff too. We've always talked about equivalent serial schedules as being transactions, T1 and T2, but implicitly, we've always been saying T1 and T2 commit. We know that. But if it's a bot, it's like they never existed before. So it's a little trick. On the slide, I can only fit two examples. But if you imagine T1, T2, T3, it's as if T1 aborted because of some violation and T2 and T3 safely could get along. It's as if it happened as two followed by three and the aborted transaction never existed. It's kind of like I could go and rewrite the history from the past for an aborted transaction. Yeah, but that's a great observation. It's like, whoa, whoa, you're telling me one followed by two, but you took away one. You took away one because we're going and changing the rules in that different way. Yeah. There's some way you could like intelligently schedule these because it's it's pretty clear by looking at it that, one, that they sort of- you, Yeah, so the question is, can you intelligently schedule this? Yes, but I don't know what T1's gonna do when T1 starts. I don't know if it's gonna write to A. You know, it'll only know what it's reading and writing as it proceeds in the transaction, it means that's the whole game. We don't know what the transaction is going to do till it starts on, starts to do its work. Isn't there any way to analyze it? Not necessarily, because if I said I've got a transaction in which I'm going to read all the bank records and only the ones that are the highest, I'm going to give a $50 bonus. Unless I look at the data statically, I cannot tell anything. You can tell what columns are. You can tell what columns you're going, but that's going to not do you much because you don't know uh, uh, which of those columns you're eventually going to go update. But this would be enough to tell you to, to, to tell you they have to do them in order in some way. The transaction, see, time is proceeding from top to bottom in all our schedules. At any point in time, you can imagine it's as if like we were at the beginning of T1. We don't know what the world's gonna look like at the next time tick. So a read may come, a write may come. We are saying, no matter what you throw at me, I want to make all of that safe and happen uh, for you. So 
if your question could be, if I knew exactly what, it's exactly the question that was asked before, if I knew exactly what the transaction was going to do, every transaction in my system only reads A and the other and writes A, the other transactions read A, write A and read B and write B. If that's all I was doing, I can do all kinds of crazy schedule, but that's a database system that can't do much. So we don't know what read and writes are going to come till the transaction proceeds. So, okay. Yep. Sorry? Ask again, sorry. The... Yeah. When you abort T1. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you, yeah, exactly. So if T1 is aborted, then it will get rerun by some mechanism. That mechanism could be you as the SQL programmer could have said, if I get an abort from this, right? You write the SQL code, you check for error condition. So if I get abort, retry it again, and you might say retry it five times or some number of times. So the application code will typically have some handling of that. Okay, all right, I need to keep moving. I'm on slide 10 of 85. All right, great. So some of you might have noticed that you could have told me here that that right of A, going back to the question that was just asked here, hey, what if I just wrote that A through that right of A, uh, because I know I, I, all that's happening if I wanted to really follow that T1 followed by T2. The database already has a right of T2, which is all I need to end up with. I could just have thrown this right away and let T1 actually commit. And it turns out that in very specific conditions like this, where you have a right over someone else's right, but you are the previous transaction, you could actually, under some conditions, throw that right away and allow this to proceed. So uh, you are perhaps starting to think like that when you ask that question. There's a rule called the Thomas Wright rule, which effectively says that in a more mathematical form, saying that when you have that specific condition of a right followed by a right based on this timestamp that the previous transaction is just trying to write that, you could allow that right to proceed. And Effectively, what this allows is with the Thomas Wright rule, you're now allowing schedules that become that are view serializable and a little bit bigger than just the conflict serializable set of schedules. And I won't prove it, but I will just leave that as a thought exercise. Right? You're allowing more schedules than you would strictly allow. Okay? So there's a proper rule. It's not that important, as I said. No one writes transaction management system with this TO protocol that we talked about. And the write rule is very famous in database uh, uh, systems. So if you ever talk to a transaction person, they'll know about it. They'll sometimes refer to it. Uh, but in practice, it's not a rule that gets used because you know, as you talked about, view serializable stuff is not what we typically end up trying to get. It's super hard to implement. So I'm going to just leave with one note that is uh, that Andy had. Andy likes to go dig up all these things. It's like, so, okay, who's this Thomas guy? And so when he dug this up, what he found was that this is a guy uh, who was at BBN, which was a networking company that did one of the earliest internet, but they were also like a think tank and they did a whole bunch of actually super interesting database stuff in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. And Andy suspects that this is the same guy who also wrote the first computer worm. There's a Wikipedia article that talks about the first computer worm was written by someone called Bob uh, uh, Thomas, also at BBN. So it's probably the same person. And if you guys know in the security literature, there's always a Bob and Alice, right? They always have Bob and Alice trying to do something that someone else is trying to interfere with. Uh, so very likely it is the same guy. Mm. Uh, thought I'd just leave that in the slides over here. You might find that interesting. All right, all right. Also gives you a little bit of relief from thinking about transactions, which can start to weigh you down. Uh, but let's get uh, moving. Here's another example with a basic uh, time order protocol. And here, what we are going to do is uh, basically just start going through this. Uh, read happens, write happens, same thing as before. Then this commit happens. And now, whoops, lost my slide. Uh, the write for A that happens, uh, it interferes because a write for two has a, a much higher value, right? So we do not update that write timestamp. Now we could skip doing this actual write as we talked about with the Thomas write rule if we were supporting that. But there's a read following that, right? So what you have to do is you do the write, but you keep it to the local copy so that that read 
is within your transaction itself, you should be reading what you just wrote and not seconds value, right? So you're going to start making a copy of stuff that you write to, to if you wanted to support that advanced mode, uh, so that the reads in your transaction, which are now allowed, they shouldn't see the second write, they should see your write. And so you're making local copies of things, okay? And we'll use this mechanism of local copies for the next protocol that we're going to talk about. All right, so we've already covered this. So I'm going to skim over it because your questions covered that. Uh, there's no deadlocks because you know uh, uh, we, we don't have that. There's a possibility of starvation. The question that was just asked over here a little while back, if I've got a long running transaction, I start on this end of the file. I may have a billion records to go through and I'm doing this at the record level. By the time I get there, someone's probably gotten ahead of me and I have to go restart and start to do other kinds of things with it. Now, if that happens, there are all kinds of things you could do with it, including things at some point you might say, I just have to pause all these other guys so that I can go through that. But there are other protocols to go follow that. All of that is kind of not super important right now, as I said, no one ever builds the, uh, this basic protocol. We're just going to use that to understand the other mechanisms. But notice, even in this next mechanism we'll talk about, there's going to be this overhead, which is there's this overhead of copying data into the transactions workspace. workspace. So as you saw, if you wanted to allow that read in T1 to happen, if you're operating on the Thomas's write rule, I needed to make a copy of that. We'll do a lot more of that in the OCC protocol. We're going to uh, do that uh, even more aggressively, and that comes at a cost. Locks have a cost, copies have a cost, right? So you're making different choices here. Uh, and long running transactions can get starved and uh, 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 we'll move on with that. The key observation, however, and this is important, why didn't we stop at locking? Why are we so interested in these protocols and their properties? It's because if I have transactions that are mostly short lived, which is what happens a lot in OLTP systems, right? Your shopping cart application is just going to look from all the customers and just pull up your customer record. These OLTP applications, they read and write very few records. They might have billions or trillions of records, but every transaction is just touching very, very small number of records, reading and writing them. And so if everything is short-lived, then forcing transactions even to come down with a hierarchical locking through the entire hierarchy and grabbing all those locks, seems like a little expensive. And these protocols that we are going to start look, that are starting to look at now with the timestamp and MVCC, which we'll talk about in the next class, they'll perform a lot better in those cases. Okay. Now, if you have a lot of conflicts, even if I have an OLTP transaction, but let's say there's a pink Barbie doll at Christmas time, and then everyone wants to uh, buy that pink Barbie doll, and there's a lock you need to grab on that object for the inventory count, then nothing's going to save you, right? Everything's going to just conflict. So it's not just short-lived, but you know, it's also like, I'm relatively not interfering with someone else. You can allow more of that parallelism to happen with these schemes and you know, there are these different trade-offs you're making. So the protocol we are going to now look at is the optimistic concurrency control protocol. And that was actually invented over here. The locking stuff happened in the 70s, late 70s, and H.T. Kung was here at Carnegie Mellon and came up with this beautiful protocol. It's a short paper. Uh, you'll read it in the ad advanced graduate level class, but even if you don't take that class, just read this paper. It's so beautifully written. Like in the, the some of these short papers, they have, Everything that you need to know about this protocol is in that paper, but it's not like 20 pages. And every word in there matters. So if you skip a word, you'll be like, whoops, I missed an important detail. Uh, and obviously, we won't go into the gory details of all of this uh, paper, but we'll get through the essence of the main parts that's in this paper. So what we will do is objects are going to uh, 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 read stuff, and they'll create their workspace. Like we were starting to create that object A for transaction one. We'll create a workspace where we will keep all the objects, and now we'll keep in that workspace everything we read or write in the transaction, not just things that we write, okay? And you'll see examples in a second. And modifications that we'll make to the transaction is all gonna happen to a local workspace. So it's kind of like GitHub, you check out the code, and maybe just check out just what you need. You make all the changes there, and then at some point you're gonna say, I'm gonna commit that back, like GitHub commit, right? So it's gonna work like that. While you've checked out, there's no interference. If both you and your uh, 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 other members of your team are working on completely separate pieces of code, and the commit is all gonna merge in and do just fine, right? So the ideas are like that. You're gonna do everything in your workspace, and then eventually you will have to write. You'll have to do that final write to the master, 
And when you write into what is called the global database, you'll before that, you'll go and make checks and make sure that everything is safe and correct. OK? All right, so let's get going on that. And today, this camera is just refusing to stay focused. All right. So there are three phases. Now, this is where the terminology is going to start to look a little weird. The first phase you're going to call a read phase. It's a read phase because from the global database perspective, all that each transaction is doing in the read phase is just reading stuff. But in that read phase is when all the work of that transaction is going to happen. It's actually going to make the changes and all of that stuff. The read write, all of that stuff is happening, but happening on local copies of the database, just like you checked out your GitHub code. To the GitHub repo, it just looked like you read it, right? And then it's only later on that the write comes in. Similar. Now it will go through a validation phase. In the validation phase, we're going to check, is it safe for me to do the final thing, which is actually make that right and make all my changes from my workspace permanent? And all the changes is just going to mean the rights. OK? So let's go into that uh, with, a, with a couple, with an example first. So now we have a database. We have the notion of checking stuff out right into our own workspace. And we'll do that, unlike GitHub, where you have to check out the whole repo here, we'll just start creating into our workspace objects as we need it. As we talked about, I as a, the transaction as it is running doesn't know upfront everything it's going to read and write. All that is just going to evolve, right? As the database system is concerned, it's just going to get read and write requests. It just has to make sure all those requests can be done as efficiently as possible, allow as many concurrent requests, and make it all safe. Correctness is important, right? So same thing. We don't know what's getting checked out. So that's where the GitHub analogy is now going to start break up, breaking up, OK? So we start. We have a transaction T1 starts and reads object A. Notice now in the global database, this is the main database, right? There's only one timestamp with the objects, which is a write timestamp. Don't need the read timestamp. So we just talked about how previously in the TO protocol, every transaction was updating reads and write timestamps. And that's kind of very expensive uh, because you even a, even a reader has to do that. Here now, we have only one timestamp and we worry about it only on writes. So still, we have to have one more field in the object, but a lot better than life was just a few slides ago. So the transaction is now in the protocol going to have read, and there's going to be this new thing called validate, and there's a write. And as I said, these are the protocol terms. The write is different than the W of A, which is the write to the object. The red stuff is the steps in the transaction. So don't confuse that write with the write of A. As I said, we are retaining the names from the original terminology in that paper. But hopefully you get that, right? It's just the right phase of the protocol, hence shown in a different color and different font. OK? So you read. And as soon as you start that read stuff, you create a workspace, which is empty. And you'll read into that the object A. So A has a value of 123. And you're going to pull that in. You can think of this workspace as being organized as a key value store, right? Here's the object, and the value is whatever it is, plus the write timestamp. And so now it is, it is 0. Uh, then Tj starts. And now notice I don't have T1 and T2. Okay, I'm calling it Ti and Tj. Because whether I comes before J or J comes before I, we're going to decide in a little bit. All right? So now we are using variables. And uh, then T2 comes in. It's grabbing from the master database that same stuff, doing its thing. And at some point, it reaches the validate phase. And the validated phase, it says, and what do I need to do with my stuff? And it'll look at its timestamp. I'll talk about the protocol in a little bit. And it'll look at its timestamp. And at that point, it's going to grab the timestamp. So till now, it's as if TI and TG are babies. They were born without a name. And now we assign them a name. And that name is a number. And that decides the order. OK, so we delayed it. We delayed assigning that number because we are trying to be optimistic. Optimistic protocol philosophically says, compared to the pessimistic protocol, saying, I think life is good. Most transactions won't interfere with each other. So let them keep doing their stuff. If I pick TI and TJs, give proper names right up front, then I'm giving myself less room to go and allow parallelism. And I'll just leave that as a statement. You'll have to read the paper or take the advanced database class to really understand that. And I'll leave this as a tidbit. In fact, you could delay this even further. 
even not at the end of read phase. You could delay till the end of the write phase. And you could say, readers, I don't even give you a number. So it's as if you're a ghost transaction, never happened, didn't interfere with everyone. You could just go ahead. So it's like very cool tricks you can play while still maintaining correctness with when you assign these transaction numbers. When do you name your transactions? When you give them the names, which are numbers in our case. So you assign that the name. Now it does a write. Uh, and when it does the uh, uh, write and commit, so that write will happen in its workspace. And then finally, it'll get committed. Uh, T2 will do its write, do its uh, own. Uh, sorry, that write stuff over here was the write phase, which had nothing to do in this case, because all it did was a read-only transaction. Uh, T2 actually has a write write, write to an object. And so notice what happens to the timestamp in the local copy. It sets it to infinity. It doesn't have a name yet. It doesn't have that number yet. So infinity says something in the future. This is, think of the write timestamp as saying it's valid till infinity for now. And then it actually gets a number. Let's say it is two. It puts that. And then finally, two becomes a permanent copy in the global database. Validate checks that am I safe to go or not. And if it says it's safe, that's when it goes forward. All right. So sounded like a lot of stuff, but it's actually super simple. Remember I told you about 30 minutes ago saying, if you really understand dependence e graphs and anomalies, the WR, WW, and uh, RW, and you can really picture that as happening as you do any protocol, it'll be super easy to understand that. So if you, the first time I read the OCC protocol, the first five times I read it, I found it super complicated. And you kind of get it, but you don't get it, and you miss certain corner cases till I drew the pictures which I'm going to show you next. And then it just became super clear. So before we get into the pictures, the main thing is in the read phase, we are now going to keep these local copies. And in these local copies, we are going to do all of our writes. And the DBMS will copy all the tuple, the transaction accesses from the shared space to the workspace. It's kind of like the checkout system, right? If you're checking out just a file or a directory. And for now, we will ignore what happens if these reads and writes to records happen via indices. And we will actually not cover that at all for optimistic methods in this class uh, at all. So just assume, how do I get to object X if I'm coming through an index or updating an index? All of that stuff, you're just going to brush under the covers. But these things all work with that. That's all I need you to know. OK? All right, so where are these pictures that I've been promising? So we're going to optimistic concurrency control works in three phases. Read is where I'm going to do all my work in my local copies, check out from the database only the objects I touch, either in read and write. And then I will enter the validation phase. And for the purpose of this uh, course, we are saying at the end of the read phases, when I get named, I get my transaction number. Then in the validation phase, I'm going to check, do I violate, if I take what I've checked out, and if I put it back, am I going to cause some violation of the serial schedule that we are all trying to achieve. I have a number now, so I know where I belong in that order. Am I going to cause trouble? And if I think I'm going to cause trouble, I'll back out of it and abort. OK? And if not, I'll go to the right phase where I'll make uh, my changes happen in this global database. So time proceeds this way. Transactions life now is defined, is broken up into three phases. T1 starts, does a read phase, where even the writes are happening in the local workspace. Then the validation phase, and then finally does the write phase. OK, so every transaction will have those three phases. The main work of the transaction is all happening in that read phase, right? The other stuff is all the concurrency control stuff. If T2 starts and does its three phases after that, no problem, right? There's no conflict. Trouble starts when you have things like this. T3, which started at some point, compare T3 and T2. Uh, T3 started before. And these T3s are not numbers. Three is not a number now, right? It's just a just a logical name. We haven't given it a real name just yet. So uh, I probably should have called it I, J, and K. Uh, uh, so T3 has started here. And then its read phase is done way later. T1 started, did all of that stuff, is in the validation phase, maybe have done other things with it. So it's these kinds of things that we want to make safe. OK, so how do we make that safe? And again, the transactions are signed at the end of the read phase. The paper is beautiful because it says you have to worry only about three things, three checks. OK? For every pair of transactions that you're considering, if any one of these checks passes, those, those two pairs of transactions are done, apply these three conditions, 
uh, to all the transactions and you are basically done. So what are these three conditions? Either one of them holds miss means that pair of transactions is safe. So I've got ti and tj. And let's say i is before j. So we are saying, I want to assign i as being ahead of j in the serial schedule. So I want to make sure all of i stuff happens before j. So pictorially, it looks like that, right? If I say i and j, i happens before j. And if all of ti happened before tj, this is trivially safe. Ti completely got done before uh, uh, ti completely got done before uh, tj, and I'm totally fine. And it's defined in the paper as saying the right phase of uh, ti is completed before tj starts its read phase. Very precise definition. Okay, that means there's no overlap, and it's all safe, and no conflicts because you can think about all uh, all the changes in i happening before j. Slightly more complicated, which is condition number two. That condition is where ti completes its right phase before ti starts its right phase, tj. So tj could have, as you can see in this example, have started to read stuff that ti is writing because the write phase of ti and the read phase of tj overlaps. Okay, So we'll disallow this by having a very simple check. I look at the write set of ti and the read set of tj if they don't conflict, there's nothing in common, then I will declare these are safe. These two transactions are safe. The last hardest case is there is a bunch of overlap. And the more precise condition is ti completes its read phase before tj starts its read phase. You're just saying i before j. Okay, That's all this is saying. Everything else, every other type of overlap is allowed. And there's a check that says, Check the right set of i and read set of j don't overlap, which is the same condition from the previous slide. You can verify later. And that the right sets of these two transactions don't conflict. And if so, I can tell you it is safe. Now, this sounds magical. You give me three rules, and you're telling me that we've got serializable schedule. And this is where it takes a long time to understand that. And this is the master picture. Put it like that. Case one, case two, case three can be thought of in the following ways. I just took exactly the same condition as before. And remember, case one said write phase of i is done before read phase starts. I just did that. There's a black transaction and a blue transaction. And the red line just says that red is the condition that HT Kung had in those three conditions. Now, why is this working out? And we are saying if any transaction either satisfies case one, they're fine, or satisfies case two, it's fine. It's not and. Any one of these checks, if two pairs of transactions pass, they are safe with each other. Okay. So why is this true? As I told you, always think of dependency graph. Three anomalies that cause arcs. Read, write, write, read, write, write. Case number one trivially says none of those happen because the, everything in I is happening before J. So all those dependencies are taken care of. Because I is less than J, we've given these names and they mean something. This means for every transaction, read followed by write is taken care of by that very nature of i and j, right? The other part is where we run into trouble. Now, case number two is slightly more general than case number one. And, but the write phase of tj only starts later. So write-write dependencies are taken care of, right? Because of the red arrow that establishes the condition, you're saying right, right happens in this way. That's the part of the condition. And so the only thing you can't check, which you have to do some more work for, is the read set and the write set. And that gives me my WR dependency. And if it's empty, I don't have any arc of the WR type, so life is good. And now you can see how the other part is saying, I couldn't even tell that. I couldn't even tell that. So I had to do both of those checks and that becomes the basis for doing optimistic concurrency control. OK, questions? So it's actually a beautiful protocol. Yes, you're checking out these copies, for which there's a cost. But these three conditions cover everything. And you check those, and you've got a protocol that is correct. Uh, could I explain the right right case? For case two, the case two, the condition in that, if you go back two slides, that was implicit in the definition of the condition. So case two said, ti completes its right phase before tj. 
So in the protocol, what happens is that when you're in the validation phase, you'll check, I am this transaction. Everyone else who's active with me, for them, I will check each pair. And for each pair, I will see if one of these cases passes. This is an if condition that says, I know for this pair that the right phase of I completes before TI, TJ starts its right phase. So it's the condition, right? So it's that if then else statement that you're checking. You're checking these three cases in that pairs of transaction checks that you're making, okay? So, uh, and as I said, it's, it's or, right? So one of these has to hold true. And in the worst case, you are always hitting case three, in which case you have to do all these right, right, uh, right set, read set, and right, right set checks. How to do those checks is, let's leave it aside. It's set containment, which you have to do efficiently, but there are algorithms for doing that. Okay, set intersection in this case, sorry. Yep. Yeah. All of this is happening during the validation phase. Uh, it's it's in the think about it as happening for TI and TJ. But the why am I hesitating with giving you an answer? For simplicity, you can assume all of this is happening for TJ TI uh, 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 for TI. It's it's symmetric in the sense when you are assigning these I's and J's is delayed, but it won't matter when it is happening. You're just saying if I'm going to make a decision with everything else that is active, I need to make sure this applies. Yeah, but the reads overlap, they're all happening to the local copy, right? So when the reads are happening, the write set and read set, they are, see, this is where the read terminology is like, what does that read mean? In the read phases, we are creating the read set and the write set. So that read phase is where all the work is happening and these write and read sets are getting created. So they could overlap and that's fine. It only matters when they're trying to write that you have to start worrying about things. Does that make sense? I, I mean, no, or you ask something else. Case three, you're saying that TJ's read phase starts after TI's read phase ends. Yeah. Can they? What happens if they overlap? If they overlap, then you will have you will have to go and uh, uh, eventually one of them is going to. So let's say they overlap, then it's one of them is going to read the right phase before the other one re reaches the right phase, right? So you'll then hit case number two, where you have to go check the right phase dependency. See, between any pair of transactions, you have to check all these conditions and say, can I determine it is to be safe, right? If you can't determine if any of these conditions don't hold, then the, uh, the transaction that's trying to check will abort itself and then go back again and start to do things. Hold on, let me just make sure that got answered. Okay, so I think the confusion is coming about like, uh, how can you convince me that there are only these three cases and no other cases, right? Is that the question you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the simple answer is that if you try to construct any other case and we can take this offline, it'll end up, these are the checks that you have to do to declare safety. If you can't do any of these safety checks, you don't know what that, but the transactions, because they'll enter the right phase in a certain way. Let me just talk about the serial protocol because and I'll come back to that question if it's not. I know there's a question on the table. This is all related to, I've only talked about the read phase where you're creating the read write set, then the validation phase where we do these checks. Then it's this write phase where everyone's getting stuck on, but that's the next slide. So the question is like, how do I do these writes? So the simplest protocol is something called serial commit. Only one transaction is allowed to be in the write phase at a given point in time. So that is why case number two will not ever have a right right overlap. So you try to arrange anything cases, it's gonna boil down to that, right? So if I say, look, all of these questions are coming because, oh, what happens if I have some overlap that I haven't thought of? That will all boil down to saying, am I allowing the right phase to be overlapped with each other in some way, okay? Now, the first version of the protocol in there says that I will grab a latch and only one transaction is allowed to go into the right phase. When they go into the right phase, they do all their rights to the global database. It's like I only allow one person to commit to the master repo and others who have to commit have to uh, wait. You can't have parallel commits. And that's the serial protocol. Obviously that is slow in that right phase, but there's a parallel protocol, which I won't talk about. I'll just allude to at a high level because it takes an hour to get through. So let me just put a pin on that. And hopefully that clarifies the confusion uh, and, and happy to take questions offline if you need to. Can we go back to the slide of case three? Yeah. Whether the 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I have my diagram wrong over here. Yep, I will go fix that. Yep, you're right. Slide number 25 is wrong. This is the one I spent like three hours on. This is correct. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good catch. Okay. Good. So you, uh, what you're saying is you take any piece of PINT base, you should be a bit, and it's because, like, I'm telling you that the serial commit protocol is in place, right? So I didn't tell you that that thing till now. That's why you're coming up with cases where it won't hold, but that will get you in place. So now the hand wavy stuff I'm going to say is that you can actually do better than the serial protocol using something called the parallel commit protocol, where you can actually allow parallelism, but its behavior is going to be identical to the serial stuff. And there's a whole section in the paper that talks about that and and we'll have to defer that to the advanced database class, okay? So, all right, I'm gonna stop here since I know I'm a little bit over time already and then pick up from slide uh, 29 in the next class. All right, thank you. <laughs> this shit is gangsta. <laughs> gangsta. <laughs> that boy's a gangsta. I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cooked up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 to send you to the pearly gates. You get Kazama trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying. For that cake, your fam, I see you wake My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great